Welcome. Before we begin, we're going to invite Trustee Roberta Yoranga up, who's going to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. So if everybody can please stand. <laughs> Thank you for joining me this morning. As you salute the flag, please remember that we have men and women in our harm's way across this nation, across our country, and across the world. And when you say the pledge, remember this is the greatest country in the world. So please join me in saluting our flag. Hand over your heart, ready to begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. All right, thank you, Trustee Uranga. Right there, I know everybody's excited to see each other. My name is Byron Cliff Breland, and I serve as the Associate Vice President for the Pacific Coast Campus. And it is, thank you. And it's a pleasure to serve as your MC this morning for College Day 2010 here at the PCC campus. Welcome. And I want to welcome you to the new Industrial Technology Center at the PCC and welcome back from a long, hot summer. Of course, for some of us, it was not nearly long enough, and it certainly really wasn't that hot. Uh, so before we begin, uh, I want to put together, a, I guess, a round of applause for Aramark and their manager, Kathy Strigo, who sponsored that great breakfast this morning. Let's give them a round of applause. <laughs> and another quick order of business, which some of you have already started to do, is if you could just simply turn to someone that you haven't seen all summer or somebody you haven't seen in a long time and just say, hello, welcome back, I'm glad to see you. <laughs> all right, thank you. I knew that would be easy for you. Well, we are certainly excited to have College Day 2010 here at the PCC. 2004 was the last time that College Day was actually held at the PCC, and actually 2001 was the very first time that College Day was ever held at PCC. And given the construction plans over the next five years and the lack of availability of facilities and grounds, we're not sure when this could actually ever happen again, but it will. So indeed, this is an historic occasion for us. The physical transformation of the campus will continue with the complete renovation of the main academic building, also known as the MDAB project, which will commence this fall and is already underway, if you haven't noticed already the portable buildings in the parking lots. When it's complete in a few years, the PCC will be completely reborn as a state-of-the-art campus that will rival any campus in the state of California and be a model for all urban institutions around the nation. And we're very excited about that. And that is something that all of us at Long Beach City College should be very happy and proud about. Let's clap that up. I do hope that you share my excitement about this change and I encourage you to stay tuned and watch our progress. And we also appreciate the patience. Now, today is Friday, August the 13th. That's right. And true to form, wild things are almost certain to happen on Friday the 13th. As such, I received a few emails from some very unlikely sources with words of advice as College Day 2010 kicks off a new school year here at Long Beach City College. The messages seem to embrace three themes surrounding the provision of a successful educational environment for students, but again, from very unlikely sources. The first email that I received related to accountability, and the message reads, you're responsible for keeping your promises to students and for making sure that education is accessible for all, especially making sure that no one is lost while traveling through the pipeline. And if all fails, please be certain to quickly clean up after yourself. Signed, your friends, British Petroleum. <laughs> Friday 13. The next message reads, make sure you are transparent in your financial dealings, for you never know when you'll be required to justify your spending habits 
And remember, more money means more problems. Thoughtfully yours, Bell City Council. <laughs> and the final message I got says, remember to be number one, you must focus on what you value the most and your performance will certainly shine through all of the potential and in many cases inevitable distractions so that you always do the right thing. And when you don't do the right thing or things don't work out, it's not always a good idea to make frantic phone calls to others in a desperate plea that might somehow help you out. Sign, respectfully, T. Woods. <laughs> well, enough with the Friday the 13th antics. Uh, like my mother always told me growing up, do as I say and not as I do. We have some guests here with us this morning, and hopefully no one from Bell City Council or uh, BP. But we do want to recognize um, one of our trustees, Doug Otto of Area 4. And of course, you've already met uh, our Vice President, Roberto Uranga, Board Vice President Roberto Uranga of Area 2. In a few moments, you'll hear more from Trustee Uranga, who will offer a few remarks on behalf of the Board of Trustees. And now I want to introduce the executive uh, committee members that are present today. Uh, but please hold your applause until after I've read all of the names. Uh, Dr. Don Lowe, our Interim Vice President of Student Support Services. Hold applause. Got a couple names. All right, we can get through it quick. Uh, our Vice President of Administrative Services, Ms. Anne Marie Gable. I'll read faster, that's what we'll do. <laughs> Our Vice President of Human Resources, Ms. Rose Delgadio. Executive Vice President of Academic Affairs, Mr. Don Burrs. And our Vice President of Economic and Resource Development, Ms. Luann Bino. Now. <laughs> now I also want to recognize the, uh, the presidents of our affiliate groups, and that is the Chai President, Elizabeth Ariaga. Is she in? AFT President, Ms. Alta Costa. CCA President, Mr. Dwayne Schaefer. President of our Confidentials, Ms. Mary McEldowney. And the Administrators Association President, Mr. Chi Chung Kern. And I also want everybody who worked on the College Day Committee to please stand up. Let's give all these individuals a round of applause. <laughs> okay, now I would like to introduce our Board Vice President, Roberto Uranga, who was first elected to the Board of Trustees in 2000 and became the first Latino ever elected to the Board. He was re-elected to represent District 2 in 2004 and 2008 and is currently in his third term. Trustee Uranga has an extensive record of community service, including President of the League of United Latin American Citizens, President of the Hispanic Business Association, and Founder and President of the Long Beach Latino Leadership. He also serves as the Chair of Elect of the ACCT Board of Directors and will be the Chair next year. Uranga graduated from California State University, Long Beach, and works for the city of Long Beach. Vice President Uranga and his wife, former council member Tanya Uranga, are the proud parents of three children, two of which are LBCC Vikings. Please join me in welcoming Board Vice President Roberto Uranga. Thank you, Dr. Brillian, just as I wrote it, except for a couple of I's and T's that you missed in there, but. I can live with that. Ain't that cool? What's it look like? Let's do, come on, come face close up, see how that looks. Right here, oh, okay. <laughs> I know this is mine, I don't diet, you know, I wish I could, but uh, yeah, I, age happens. As they were talking about uh, you know, Friday the 13th, the best thing about Friday the 13th is that Friday the 14th comes afterwards. And Friday the 14th tomorrow is my birthday, so that's good. <laughs> I know, it sounds a little self-serving, but hey, you know, if I don't congratulate myself, who will, you know? Um, bueno, buenos dias, guten tag, bona demand, bonjourno, 
Benvenuti. Welcome. I think that's all I remember from uh, It's a Wonderful World in, in Disneyland. <laughs> But I'm pretty sure that uh, given the diversity this morning that uh, there's probably about another 30 or 40 languages represented and, and I'll be very happy to hear what those, uh, what those languages are so I could expand my vocabulary next time around. I hope you all had a wonderful morning this morning. Uh, with this College Day event today, we come to the end of summer, but then again, the beginning of another academic year. This is a special day for a college. It is when we gather together to catch up with friends, share stories about the summer, and most importantly, to prepare for the year that is ahead. And while we look forward to much good and better news this coming year, we know that 2010 and 2011 is going to be a challenging year for all of us. California's budget problems continue to make our work difficult. We continue to struggle with making enough class and service offerings to meet the students' needs. Unfortunately, we are not alone in this struggle. We have a budget crisis not only in California, but across the country, and many colleges are struggling everywhere. But the real tragedy is that with this ongoing deficit, there are no quick solutions and no easy solutions. The Board of Trustees is aware of the demands you are facing and will work hard to support you in any way we can. We thank you for your service, for your hard work, and for your dedication. We will also collaboratively and creatively work with you so that you can, we can continue together to meet the needs of our students with the diminishing resources available to us. As you probably have noted, our building program continues to transform both our campuses and as our facility and our older facilities like Building A at the LAC and, and the MD, what's that, MDAB? MDAB at the PCC, all these acronyms are modernized to serve our students and community better. And I really want to thank our, the, community, the citizens of our service community, the cities of Signal Hill, Lakewood, Avalon, Long Beach, for passing two bonds within the last 10 years in 2002 and 2008 to make this happen. We will, we will also continue to watch our student success initiative to help more students, more of our students reach their degree, certificate, and transfer goals. The Student Success Initiative has dramatically changed the way we educate students, and the initial results appear to be very promising. So we have much to look forward to. And while we will face adversity, I know that we're all up to the challenge. For nearly 83 years, LBCC has been about students and their success. This college has earned a strong reputation and enjoy, enjoys a prominent place in the cities it serves. I know we will continue to improve and grow over the next 83 years. So on behalf of the Board of Trustees, I thank you for all you have done and will do to help our students succeed and to help our institution improve in the coming year. Thank you very much. Thank you, Board Vice President Uranga, for that welcome and also for your remarks. I um, also want to uh, introduce Ms. Joan Carr, who's president of the management team. I'm sorry, Joan, I miss you. Are you here? She's over there. Sorry, Joan, missed but not forgotten. Now it is my pleasure to introduce the president and superintendent of Long Beach City College. President Eloy Ortiz Oakley is in his fourth year as president after previous service to the college as the Executive Vice President of Administrative Services. President Oakley is a true community college success story. After graduating from high school and spending four years in the U.S. Army, he began his higher education at Golden West College and found his professional mission there. From Golden West, President Oakley transferred to the University of California at Irvine, where he earned a BA in Environmental Analysis and Design and his MBA in Business Administration. On a personal note, President Oakley and his wife, Bernadette, are the proud parents of one Long Beach City College graduate and three future Vikings. Please join me in welcoming President Eloy Ortiz Oakley.
Thank you, Byron. And if this crowd doesn't know who I am by now, then I don't know what we're doing here. But uh, <laughs> thank you. Um, I want to uh, take a moment and recognize a very important person uh, to Long Beach City College, uh, to Long Beach Community College District, and that's, uh, I see one of our personnel commissioners, Janine McManical Ball. Please stand up, Janine. <laughs> the personnel commissioners uh, give their time willingly to this college and help us uh, be the great college that we are, and certainly all of us as employees owe, th owe them a great uh, debt of gratitude. So thank you, Janine, and please give my thanks to Darwin and, uh, and Richard when, when you see them. I also want to thank uh, the Board of Trustees as well. I know they, they were recognized, <clears throat> excuse me, I know uh, uh, Dr. Tom Clark and Jeff Kellogg and Mark Bowen could not be here today. They're in various places throughout the, the United States right now, but uh, they send their best as well, along with Trustee Otto and uh, Trustee Uranga. It is truly a team effort, and they are certainly part of this family and consider themselves part of you. Uh, so I want to thank them for all of their service as well. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to do something different today. I'm not going to uh, bang my fist on the dais. I'm not going to uh, uh, get into a frenzy about student success right now. I'm going to leave that to Kay. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I've, uh, it, it's a pleasure to be back for this fall. I'm really excited to get started on another academic year. And, and I want to just take a few moments to talk about um, what you all have done in the previous academic year. Um, first of all, thank you. This last year was a difficult year, by any measure, on any of a number of fronts, for everyone, for everyone in this room, it was a difficult year. Whether at work, at home, with your family, with your children, with your relatives, this country, this state, this community, this college have been through some tough times. But I want to thank you. Thank you for getting through the year in the way that you did. I know there were some days where you wondered, are we really all part of the same family? But we are. And we did pull through the year in one piece. So I want to thank you all, faculty, staff, all of the students, everyone here, the Board of Trustees, our administrators, for continuing to keep the Long Beach City College family together. I know difficult times are not over, but I know with this year behind us, I think we all have the confidence that we will get through this year just as well. Um, I also want to take a moment to thank you for all that you did for our students. We had some of the greatest numbers that we've experienced in a long time, and I'm not going to get into those numbers, but you know, every year I get a publication from the uh, uh, community college newspaper where they report on the top 100 colleges in terms of certificate completion or AA degrees. Previous to this last year, every time I would pick up the annual um, version of that magazine, I would be a little depressed. Long Beach City College was never in those top 100. This last year, we were in five categories. And I know that that will continue to climb. <laughs> and you know what really made me proud? Two of the top categories were in awarding certificates to Hispanics. So thank you on behalf of all our students for the work that you're doing. I know all of you, particularly those of you who are serving our students in admissions and records, in the cashier's office, who see them day to day, uh, and all of our faculty who work with our students day in and day out in the classrooms, I know you question some days what is going on with our students. But I can tell you today that these students are here for a reason. They're here to make their lives better. And I think we can all agree that certainly in the last eight years that I've been here, I have never seen hungrier students that I've seen now. And that is a great thing. The value of their education has been increasing every day that they live in this economy. They are realizing how much they need you. So take the time. 
take the time this semester and begin on Monday. I ask you all to take these next three weeks, three weeks out of this semester, and just spend every chance you get on helping one student. If you all just pick one student. Now, I know many of you pick hundreds of students during the semester, and I thank you for that. But if you all just take the time to grab one student, pull him or her aside, and help them through their day, it will make a huge difference. They need your help. We need them to succeed. Our economy will not survive in California or this nation if we don't do a better job of getting these students to complete their educational goals, whatever that might be, certificates, associate degrees, transfer, we have to do that job every single day so that I can have a retirement when I grow old. <laughs> so if not for the moral reason, do it for the economic reason. But we got to get it done. And I thank you in advance for all that you do. So in doing so, I want you to, you've already turned to each other to welcome each other back. Now I want you to turn to the person next to you and thank them for all that they do to support our students. And I thank you. Okay, that's enough. <laughs> now, now I, I also want to say that um, I, I thank you for letting me to continue to serve as your president. It is just a pleasure. It is truly a pleasure to be part of Long Beach City College. I get the opportunity to go throughout the state and make a lot of trouble in the state and uh, go throughout the nation. And everywhere I go, I'm known as the president of Long Beach City College. And that gives me an experience that is just tremendous because everyone in this country respects what you do here at Long Beach City College and has heard about the work that you're doing. So thank you for allowing me to serve. Now, I'm going to end with two thoughts. One is, to look back, to look back on summer. This was a difficult summer for our students, by any measure. And certainly, you know, although we always try to make the very best decisions, some days they're not as great decisions as others. But we continue to learn. And I commit to you that we will continue to learn from every decision that we make. But this summer was tough for our students. It was tough for you all. If you were faculty, counselors, classified staff this summer, you heard a lot of complaints, and deservingly so. So we've got to reflect. Yes, we don't have control over the budget, and yes, we don't have control over whether or not we can meet the demand that's coming through our doors right now, but we can control how we interact with our students and how we work to ensure that we do everything we can to create an environment where they're successful. So let's reflect on what didn't go so well this summer, reflect on what went well and continue to move forward and continue to build upon that. So for these next few weeks, let's reflect on that, think about what we can do to get these students through the front door and to focus on our front door. Our front door, as I'm sure you'll hear, and I'm not going to steal Dr. McClain's thunder, is the most important part of our students' experience. Who they see, who they touch, who they get information from in the first few weeks of school makes such a huge difference. So please, let's focus on the front door. Let's not get lost in the minutia of our jobs, because we love to do that. We love to sit in 100 different committees and focus on things that are not central to our students. So let's take these first three weeks before we get caught up and focus on those students and get them through those first three weeks. So, Thank you for uh, listening to me this morning. Thank you for all that you're going to do this summer, I mean, excuse me, this fall. And now I have the great pleasure of introducing a good friend who I've been able to spend quite a bit of time with over the last couple of years, who I'm very proud to introduce to you today. Her name is Dr. Kay McClenney. Dr. McClenney is a faculty member in the Community College Leadership Program at the University of Texas at Austin. That part I won't hold against her. 
I have a lot of Texans in my family. <laughs> she directs a number of projects, including the Ford Foundation's National Community College Bridges to Opportunity Initiative and the MetLife Foundation's National Student Retention Project. Trustee Otto and I have had the great pleasure of working closely with Dr. McClenny in her role as the co-director of the California Leadership Alliance for Student Success, a group of 12 community college leaders in California who are working to develop strategies to increase successful outcomes for our community college students in California. Dr. McClenny is one of the most sought after speakers and consultants on higher education issues and the author of numerous publications. She earned, earned her PhD in educational administration from the Community College Leadership Program at the University of Texas at Austin, and she has been named a distinguished graduate of the program. We're very lucky to have her here today. She brings a wealth of experience that I know she'll tell you about. Her and her husband, Byron, are also very much involved in the Achieving the Dream Initiative, which has over 130 community colleges throughout the United States that is strictly focused on improving student success throughout the nation. As we get this new academic year started, please join me in giving Dr. McClenny a great Viking welcome. Good morning, Long Beach City College. It's a delight to be here with you and to talk about what I like to talk about and what I know you are here to do, and that is what we all need to be doing individually and collectively to promote higher levels of student success for community college students. I am not a complete stranger to your work because I have had the opportunity uh, over the past several years to read a lot, to talk a lot, to interact uh, with the leaders of the institution, both on the board uh, and the administration, and a number of the faculty leaders for your work. You are part of what I see as a sea change in the American community college movement. For a hundred years or more, we have been dedicated in community colleges to ensuring opportunity and access for large numbers of students. We have accomplished what no other country in the world has accomplished in terms of access. Now, however, from the White House to the State House, uh, across the philanthropic community and the business community comes the call for increasing educational attainment, for increasing completion of certificates and degrees amongst our population. Why is that? Well, let me give you the answer in one run-on sentence. No, two, one short and one run-on. The short one is the United States has fallen from first in the world to most recently this summer in a report 13th in educational attainment by comparison with other developed countries. That's not a good prospect for us as a nation. But the second, here's the run on, is this. The more educated a person is, the more likely she is to be employed to be paying taxes, to be voting, to be working in the democratic process, to be volunteering in the community, to be giving blood, to be capable of taking care of the health and educational needs of her children. And conversely, the less likely she is to be publicly dependent on welfare or in jail. That's why we need to care, not only that students come through our door, but that we make good on the promise of access. Along with that, Mr. Vice Chair, comes a promise of equity. There are intolerable and I would say dangerous gaps that separate in our colleges the fortunes of high income or middle income people from those who are from lower income backgrounds and the prospects of students of color from those who are less colorful. So here's what we're going to do today. And I'm going to be talking fast because I have a lot I would like to share. And we're going to be talking about what's being learned. Uh, as Eloy indicated, I'm involved with a number of initiatives across the country that are addressing with community college how do we improve outcomes for our students. And I also direct the Center for Community College Student Engagement. We have surveyed through two surveys over the last several years almost two million community college students, many of them in California colleges, about their educational experiences. 
And so I'm going to be sharing with you some data this morning. It's national data about community college students. I hope you will be curious about the extent to which these data apply to your students. I guarantee you they do. And I'm also going to be sharing some short video clips of actual students talking about their experience. Behind our survey data, we do a lot of focus groups in order to understand the real voices and the authentic experiences of students that are behind all of those numbers. And so I think they speak more powerfully than I do, and I want to share that with you. So we start through a list. What matters most in promoting student success? Engagement matters. The work that I do at the Center for Community College Student Engagement is based on about 20 years of research in undergraduate education, and it all says this, engagement matters. The more engaged students are, the more involved, the more connected they are with one another, with faculty, with student services professionals, and with the subject matter they teach, the more likely they are to learn at higher levels, persist in college, and attain their goals. So we have replicated now that research. A lot of it was done with four-year college students. We know that engagement matters for community college students as well. And furthermore, we know that engagement of community college students because they're multitasking individuals does not happen by accident. We have to intend to do it. We have to purposefully design the kinds of educational experiences that make it inescapable for students to engage with the college, with us as individuals. And we're going to talk about some of the ways that that can happen. I'm going to start this morning. How many of you are faculty? Uh, we're going to start with engagement in the classroom because, truthfully, uh, that's where we have our best opportunities to get to students. Um, where do they go after class? Away. <laughs> back to work, back to their families, uh, and the like. And so, and so let's do this. One of the things that, that we ask students in focus groups is to tell us, what's a good class? When it's really working for you, when it's clicking, what is it that's happening? And so, here's a sample of what students say. The teacher can interact and be on the same level as the kids, and we, everybody's just, the atmosphere is just great. Everybody knows what's going on, and everybody's interested, and everybody's active, and the teacher is treating us like, you know, like it's not just another lecture. It's actually a class, and you can make it fun. It's always a very active class, where everybody interacts with the professor, make questions, do uh, uh, discussions about the, the subjects we are going to see. And For me, the fact that I could go to my professor and ask her a ton of questions without her thinking it's monotonous. And she doesn't get tired of you easily. You could always go to her if you are not clear about something. And two, like if she sees your potential and she knows that you're trying to do better, she doesn't crush your ego or you know your, your, your confidence she helps you a lot and she 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 tells you you know you're doing good and you could do better you know you know you're a good student she makes you want to learn and do better in her class she really seems like she cares about our opinions about things and she always whenever we come into class I know it sounds really elementary but we have this thing called weather check where she asks us how we're feeling and how our day's going and it just shows that she really cares and wants to establish that good discussion forum with us. So She makes me think hard, like so much about this, certain situations, about current events and stuff. And I learned a lot. I mean, it keeps me thinking, you know. And actually, it helps me a lot. And um, like when we do our homework, actually like writing essays and stuff, everything comes out easy because like he helps us to think, think critically and stuff so it's very beneficial to me. After that first day everybody starts to open when like one person starts to talk and then another one to kind of come in and then another one to come in then it becomes more comfortable so the interacting with the students and the teacher it helps a lot here. I've noticed a lot of that in my classes a lot of interaction with discussions and just different things and then you know that eventually come to you know after class you know 
if you need help with something, you know, they're like, do you understand it? You're like, yeah. And then become friends and study buddies and stuff like that, so. Okay, so I have the other tape. You know, when we say the question, so when it's not working, I'm going to spare you that tape uh, this morning, but you can imagine that it's just exactly the opposite of what you just heard. So data, active and collaborative learning is one of the benchmarks on the Community College Survey of Student Engagement, and I will tell you that the degree to which students are, are actively, collaboratively learning in their classrooms is the most powerfully predictive factor involved in grade point average, course pass rates, uh, associate degree attainment, persistence from term to term. It's the most powerful predictor. And so I'm just going to give you a couple of samples here. And this is, this is the audience participation part. We ask students how frequently they work with other students on assignments or projects during class. Collaborative learning, group work. What do you think nationally is the percentage of students who say that they do that often or very often? 30. I hear 10. I hear 30. 25. 25. You guys are pessimists. <laughs> Look at this. Okay. Uh, so the question is, um, you know, is that going on in your classroom? Um, so we always look at the often, very often, we look at the never. Uh, and this is in class. So uh, let's talk about outside of class. Um, what happens then? How, how frequently are students working with other students outside of class? Often or very often? What percent? Is it larger or smaller than the in class? Smaller. smaller. It's half. Uh, it's less than half as often. Uh, and often, I will tell you, uh, when faculty members talk with me about this, they say, well, we can't ask them to do anything outside of class. Well, yes, you can. And we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, another benchmark uh, and a powerful predictor of student retention in college is the degree of student-faculty interaction. It happens in a lot of different ways. It happens in class, out of class, online, on the phone. Uh, it happens in a lot of ways. Uh, this one is my particular favorite. Uh, because it goes to a, a, a romantic notion that you see mostly in the movies about what higher education is like. Uh, you know, that, that vision that we have of the student walking across the campus under the drifting maple leaves with a professor and a cup of pre-Starbucks coffee while having a profound conversation about Socrates or how to insert a central line or whatever it is they do. Uh, so, how often is that happening? What percentage of American community college students are discussing ideas from readings, projects, assignments with faculty members outside of class? Come on. Five? All right. Sixteen percent. Okay, now look at this one. Nearly half of our students never have that experience. So when President Oakley says something like, reach out to a student, catch that student in the hallway, catch that student after class, uh, they follow me into the restroom. I'm sure it happens to you as well. So catch them wherever you can catch them. OK, the second thing that matters most is that we have to do this engagement, again, to echo the president, early, early and often. Uh, 15% of community college students who start this fall will never complete a college credit. So what we do during the intake process and during the first three weeks of class is enormously important. I will tell you here that students who haven't made a meaningful connection with your college by the middle of their first term of enrollment will disappear. So. Um, all of that reality caused us to run back to the beginning of the community college experience and survey students during the fourth and fifth weeks of class so that we can tell colleges what students are experiencing and they can use those data to target improvements. Now I'm going to give you a few samples of that information that we learned from entering students along the way. First though, I said we do focus groups and I mentioned this to some folks yesterday so you guys get to keep quiet right now. Uh, usually in focus groups we ask students some variation on the question, uh, did you ever think of dropping out of college? 
And students, I, I'm not kidding you, they typically laugh at us when we ask that question. And they often look at their watches and say, yeah, I think about it about every 20 minutes. You know, I'm just about due. And so the follow-up is to say, what has made the difference? Why are you still here? What is the most important factor in your experience that is helping you stay in college? What do you suppose they say? Say? I hear faculty. Okay, they do say that. They give us the name of a person, always. That's what happens. It's always about a relationship. And then they tell us about what difference that person made. A faculty member who worked with them when they were struggling, struggling in a class. A faculty member who took time after class to talk with them about this course and how it can lead to a career or to a transfer program. A counselor or an advisor who really made a difference for them. Increasingly, students are telling us that it is other students. Hey, ambassadors back there, you matter. Uh, that, you know, I was in a learning community or I was in a required study group or I was in a, some sort of cohort experience in a nursing program and the other students wouldn't let me quit. We didn't stop studying till the, for the midterm until all of us were ready. When my grandmother got sick, they called me and said, get yourself back to school. And so it is all of that kind of connection that really, really matters. So in focus groups, uh, we sometimes break students up into small groups and we say, if you ran the zoo, the college, what would it look like? What would you do more of? What would you stop doing? What would you do if you were in charge? And um, I want to show you just some brief clips of students reporting out on their conversations about how they would design a college. Ready? The first of which is that there would be a more personal orientation Hold on. with tour. Um, Can we get the options they give you are take personal orientation or... I'm going to go back uh, because I want you to hear the first part of this. The first of which is that there would be a more personal orientation with tour. Um, the options they give you are take personal orientation or do an online orientation. I can understand how it would be more convenient sometimes to take an online orientation, but really having more personal orientation with a tour so that you can understand where the buildings are, what the lettering system is, and how the college works in general, we thought that would be very important because without that information, it's easy to get lost on this campus because it's pretty big. First, I'd like to say that I don't know why everybody else got to use a marker <laughs> <laughs> and use a pen. It's too late now. <laughs> I appreciate you. Um, so uh, part of my group thought it would be a, uh, a good idea if we had maybe a line on the ground leading from outside of Thunder Duck Hall into the admissions office so that you know where it is. Um, and four, they say a mandatory orientation, more um, so basically get rid of online orientation. Um, again, they said that they have more of a personal thing with a group orientation and you get to, you also get to meet uh, counselors and you know, other students. Okay, what two words jumped out at you from that set of clips? Personal, 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 personal. Students use that word all the time. They want opportunities to connect with other students, with faculty, with staff. Unfortunately, I showed this clip uh, at a college in Ohio immediately after a woman had been on the dais given their Innovation of the Year Award for inventing their new online orientation. <laughs> so, you know, <laughs> I gave her CPR and then, and then I said, okay, if you're gonna do online, which students hate, uh, then how are you going to connect? You know, what's your alternative strategy for seeing to it that students have these personal uh, interactions? And so, what was the other word you heard? Okay, I, you're, keep, keep thinking. There's a word in there that surprises a lot of people. Mandatory. 
Students use the word mandatory all the time. And we weren't quite sure we believed them. And so, and so we would ask push back and ask follow-up questions in focus groups. Uh, and they use the word mandatory about orientation, about student success courses, about study groups, about uh, visits to the tutoring lab, about supplemental instruction. I mean, they use it all the time. And so we say, do you mean mandatory? And they say back at us, kind of flippy, they say, yeah, mandatory, like it should be required of all students telling us what it means. And so we say, OK, well, suppose you came to the college and they told you that this was required. How would you react? And they said, well, first we'd whine. OK, you'd whine. And then what would you do? Well, then we'd do it. Why would you do it? Because you made us do it. And so that's the dialogue. But I want to tell you in all seriousness that our students expect us as educators if we know that there are experiences that matter in helping them be more successful in college. They expect us to make that a part of their experience. And they think that when we don't, we're not doing our jobs. So consider this. This is the McClenney first rule of the universe, and it is students don't do optional. You know, the truth of the matter is, yeah, OK, all right. If you take notes, that's the only thing you need to walk away from, from here today. I'm, I'm serious. That is the most important thing I'm going to say to you. And you know, the truth of the matter is that students are just a whole lot like human beings. Uh, okay? All right. Personal connections. Uh, this is data about students' first impressions of the college. And the, and the item is, the very first time I came to this college, I felt welcome. Which part of this pie chart jumps out at you, makes you curious? Which part? Which one? The one that makes me think twice is the one that says that 35% of our students have no opinion. That's kind of like a, uh, you know, I'm not sure that uh is the response that we would aspire to have students providing us about how they felt as they engaged with our campus for the first time. Um, and here's another question about that connections. Was a specific person assigned to you? And it doesn't matter what person, it can be a peer, an ambassador, uh, a counselor, an advisor, a faculty member, a group of students. Uh, was someone assigned to you that you could go to for information and assistance each time you needed that? And it looks like about 84% of our students say that's not happening. OK, orientation. Uh, somebody asked about literature on orientation yesterday. Every decent study done of college orientation in the last 15 or 20 years shows that it matters uh, in promoting student success. And I'm just showing you this to indicate that after three weeks in college, 28% to 30% of community college students nationally don't know there is any such thing as orientation. They're not aware of it. What matters? One of the most poignant things that we hear from students in we, when we do focus groups is that they often, more often than we, we, we would like, think we don't expect enough of them. And that's always an interesting conversation when I have it with faculty. And I want to show you some related data that I think you will relate to. High expectations matter. As Vince Tinto says, no one rises to low expectations. So let's take a look at this. What do you think is the percent of entering students in community colleges who strongly or somewhat agree that they have the motivation that it takes to succeed in college? They have the motivation. What's the percent? 29, 30, I'm hearing. What else? 100. OK, we've got a range. We've got from 25 to 90 percent. They are so jazzed. Some of them are terrified when they show up at your college. Some of them are terrified, but they're jazzed. They think this is going to be a life-changing experience. And so 90% of them are saying they have the motivation. Now, um, what is the percentage of entering students in our colleges who believe that they are academically prepared to succeed in college? I'm hearing 90, 70. OK. 
Of course, that's just about the number that, if we're realistic, actually needs some kind of basic skills uh, education, especially in uh, urban environments. So we ask students these questions in focus groups, and, and, and they're telling us they think they're motivated and they're academically prepared. And uh, why do you think they think that? Because they graduated from high school. That's what they say to us. So I cannot overemphasize how delighted I am and how impressed I am with the relationships that are being built and, and sustained between the sectors of education in Long Beach through the Long Beach Partnership. Uh, we're not going to dramatically reduce the need for remediation in our colleges without those kinds of partnerships. And students come to us really believing they're ready because they completed a high school where the graduation standards are not aligned with what we expect of them in college. Okay, now, they're highly motivated, they are academically prepared, and these are the things they report to us about their behaviors during the first three weeks of class. Almost 30% of them turned in an assignment late at least once, 22% didn't turn in an assignment at all, 41% uh, came to class unprepared at least once, and about a fifth of them skipped class at least once during the first three weeks of college. Faculty members, are these successful student behaviors? No. Okay. So we ask them what they do, they tell us this, and we say, why do you do that? And what do you suppose they say? They say, because I can. <laughs> because there are no consequences. We also ask questions about how much we expect of students in terms of how much they read, how much they're required to write, uh, and that sort of thing. And this is national data for full-time students only. When we asked them how many papers or reports of any length did you write during this entire academic year? And so full time, entire academic year, any length. It could be a one page essay, it could be a three page book report, it could be a 30 page research paper. 30% uh, of students nationally say that they are writing four or fewer assignments during an entire academic year. Okay, so every year on the, the uh, SESI survey, we, we have, and how many of you are student services people, counselors, student services, okay. Uh, we have a, a set of items that, that list an array of services that most comprehensive community colleges offer, and uh, they include things like career counseling and child care and tutoring and financial aid advising and academic planning and advising and, you know, that whole uh, array of services. How frequently do they use them? How important are they? And how satisfied are they with these services? So what do you think they say is the most important service we offer? I hear financial aid coming out, and I appreciate that because somebody always says financial aid and they're always wrong. Uh, truth is, we thought they would say financial aid too, and so uh, we were surprised when we find that every year since 2001, every single year in 755 colleges across 49 states, students say that the most important service they, that we offer is academic planning and advising. And so let me show you how far you go to get to financial aid. It's not that it's not important. But so we ask students why this is important. And they say, you know, it's not about putting together the course schedule. It's about having a plan for starting where I am and arriving at some different and better place three or four or five or eight years down the road and having milestones along the way that show me the pathway to that place. So we're going to listen. When you go in there, they're just going to do the basics, like set you up with the basic classes, but they're not going to show you, oh, you need to take these classes to get towards your major. Then you might end up scheduling classes that you don't necessarily need, and then that's wasting your time as well. But yeah, close mouth, don't get fed. If you don't say anything, then they won't necessarily give you that information. You got to, you know what I'm saying, fish for it. It isn't like they just easily give it to you. Well, she sat down with me and 
told me, you know, what to expect with nursing and um, made sure that that was the field that I was sure I wanted to go into and she helped me set up all of my classes and it, it was really good. She was really thorough and she was great. He helped me too because I told him my like goal at the end, you know, and what classes I should take for my undergrad before I even go to my secondary school. And I think that's so, so important because the schools I'm looking into now to transfer to, I have to see what classes I need to take to get to where I need to go. And I, I believe for me anyways, if I didn't sit down and take that time, what's the point? I'd be taking classes that would be irrelevant. I wouldn't use any of the credits. I would be, I mean, it's always good to learn. But when we have a goal, it's like, what progress am I making toward that goal? The classes I need to take, the prerequisites for what major, and then, you know, whatever field I'm going into. So I think that's the most important for college, is not, not to, not, I, mean, I hate to say waste time, because classes aren't waste of time, but the ones that we need to take to get to where we need to, to be. Okay, so academic planning and advising involves several different functions, and we asked students about uh, three or four of them. Um, turns out that the place that community colleges do their best work is in the place that students say is least important, and that is completing the course schedule. Somebody, 69% of the time, uh, somebody is helping students uh, get, get their courses uh, selected. The second function, though, about helping me set goals and create an academic plan to achieve those goals, uh, we're falling off there. We got 31% of students who are having that experience early in their collegiate time. And then there's this other dilemma. My English class, I'm doing great. But my math class, I am not doing well at all. And I think I took on too much at one time. Um, the English, um, I, my time is allotted for maybe two classes, but I took on three classes. And so that really just, and not ever going to school before it, I went and did something that I should have really got a lot of counsel on. And so I jumped and said, yeah, I can do this, and I can do that, and oh, yeah, take a psychology class too. And so I took math, English, psychology, and now I am catching it. <laughs> <laughs> so for a first time person going to a community college and your time, you know that you have X amount of time, and you haven't really studied to find out how much time you're going to need to do uh, your classes or to do your studies or your homework then you're lost, really, when you go in. And that's what happened to me. I went in, and I knew what the approach that I wanted. I knew what I wanted to go after. And so I went after that. But nobody said, what about your job? What about your home? Right. What about your children? What about the time you need to spend with your wife? What about church? I right, don't tell you nothing. And so now, I have a schedule that I have to put all of that to the side so that I can focus only on schoolwork. And so it's school schoolwork bad, bad. Schoolwork school work bad, bad. schoolwork school work bad. bad. Pretty powerful, isn't it? Listening to students. Listening to students. Uh, and so we ask students, does someone at the college sit down with you and help you figure out how to balance all this stuff in your life, help you figure out how many classes you can take and still make your life work. And 22%, about a fifth of our students, say that that is an experience that's part of their entry into the community college. Um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on basic skills. I, I am putting this up here in order to reinforce the point uh, that is evident from the California Basic Skills Initiative and other work that you are doing, that if we can't get this right, if we cannot get better results from basic skills education, most of our students have no future at all. 
And we're talking about lives, not just about numbers. Let me give you one hopeful statistic. Out of the hundreds of thousands of students who are involved in the National Initiative on Achieving the Dream, 130 colleges in 26 states, 72% um, of them need at least one course in developmental or basic skills mathematics. Here's, here's the statistic. Students who enroll in and successfully complete any basic skills course with a grade of C or better in their first term of enrollment, you with me? From that point forward are more likely to persist and succeed in college than any other group of students, including the students who didn't need basic skills education in the first place. So what else do we need to know in order to make that focus on the front door and to figure out how to leverage and focus limited resources so that students are successful in the first term, so that they are taking the fundamental academic preparation work that they need in order to be able to see, succeed in college level classes? Huge, huge issue for American community colleges. Uh, there are a lot of things uh, about state policy that matter here. Uh, it's never fundamentally mattered whether community colleges did this work well. Uh, you can be treated exactly the same across the state uh, if one college does an excellent job and another college never gets a student through the basic skills sequence. Not going to work for us. Okay, and so to, to pull all of this together and wrap up quickly, uh, there are some things that we are asking of ourselves that are really about rethinking the way we meet students, the way we bring them in, and what their experience needs to look like based on evidence of what works, evidence of what matters for these students. And so a little reprise here. Student success by design, and I'm throwing up here um, a bunch, of, a bunch of colleges that are doing different things. They're not all doing the same thing. There are no magic bullets. But these are all complex, diverse, many of them urban institutions, multi-campus, multi-college uh, organizations where they are moving the needle on student success. They are improving. Uh, basic skills course completion rates, they are improving freshman uh, gatekeeper course completion rates, they are improving term to term retention, and many of them are already on the road to significantly improving graduation rates. Uh, it is not about doing the same thing, it's about figuring out for your college what will you commit to do at scale so that we're helping large numbers of students rather than a fortunate few. Um, here's the deal, and this is the evidence. Mandatory matters. We have to be willing to design the educational experience that helps our students be successful. And so I hear from faculty, you know, we can't do mandatory. Yes, you can. I hear from faculty, that makes us more like a high school. No, it doesn't. It makes you more like Dartmouth. I have a granddaughter who just completed her freshman year at Dartmouth. Ask me if orientation was optional. Ask me if participation in the entire first year experience at Dartmouth was optional. No, it wasn't. It's the way they do education at Dartmouth. And we have the opportunity, you have the opportunity to figure out what is education at Long Beach City College? What do we want our trademark to be in terms of students and their success? It's a great, great opportunity. I think none of this can be done without data. Uh, and here I uh, take a bow uh, to Eva, uh, who has been working with us on tracking cohorts. Yeah. 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 Never happens, does it? Yay. That's great. Thank you. Thank you for showing that appreciation. Uh, we can't get better at what we're not willing to look at. And Eva is helping us look at what happens to students as they come to and through Long Beach City College or don't. And we look at disaggregated data so that we can see which students disproportionately are falling through the cracks and not succeeding in the college. We really must do that work. This is one of my favorite cartoons and it's a, 
You know, it's, it's human. Uh, and community colleges have lived for a long time very comfortably in a culture of anecdote. We all have a wagon load of stories about students whose lives have been saved and changed because of their experience in Long Beach City College, right? Right? Oh, yeah. And the good news is that most of those stories are actually true. Uh, but the typical student experience is what we need to be looking at. Unfortunately, those anecdotes are about the best student experience, not the typical student experience. And it's by using data to guide our inquiry, to make us curious, to help us wonder what's going on and how we might make that better that is such a powerful tool. We have to stop thinking about student success as a project. Um, I, I um, said to the group yesterday that if I had to say what is the greatest enemy of improving successful outcomes for students in American community colleges, I would say it's a 50-year history of doing projects. Projects, whether they are funded by foundations or by the chancellor's office or by the federal government, wherever the money comes from, we have this habit of arraying projects around the margins of our institutions. They often do very good work for a very small number of students. And when the money goes away, the project goes away. And we, as colleges, are left otherwise untransformed. That is not going to get the job done. So. Yeah, thank you. Here's the best news I bring to you. This is not an impossible dream. This is possible work. It requires focus. It requires a willingness to set priorities, to rigorously examine our practice and see what's working and to scale up what works. That means we have to stop doing some stuff that's not working so well. This can happen. Long Beach City College does not want to be average. So don't look at any of the data I've told you about, told you about national averages and think that if you just do that well, that it'll be OK. The national average is none too good. And that's why we're all involved in this student success movement in community colleges. It is a quintessential faculty and professional educator responsibility to ask the question, how good is good enough at Long Beach City College? That should be your goal. So. Very quickly, uh, McClenney's Rules of the Universe. Uh, this is the first one, and if we're not on board with this, uh, after all of the discussion we've had about student success at Long Beach City College, uh, then it's probably time to find another career. The center of our work is about student learning persistence and success. Secondly, what I just said, we can't get better at what we're not willing to look at. We need curious people who inquire and wonder and keep inquiring and keep wondering about how we can get better. This comes from Peter Singy. Think about this, folks. Every college, every program, every course, every syllabus is pretty much perfectly designed to get precisely the results we're currently getting. Right? OK. So if that's the case, and if we're not at whatever level entirely happy with the results we're getting, what's the implication? OK. And this one comes from Alcoholics Anonymous. <laughs> I am very proud of uh, what I've seen in terms of the board's work here, as well as President Oakley's, in terms of helping to help us find the North Star of student success. Uh, we, don't, we don't accomplish goals, either of graduation from college or of attaining equity across our student groups, if we never actually explicitly, collectively decide that that's what we're going to do. And when we decide it, Please remember this. This comes from the uh, International Healthcare Quality Council. Do you, some of you in the medical fields know about the 100,000 Lives campaign, where a bunch of hospitals and medical professionals across the country got together and they said to themselves, if we would just do more and more consistently what we know matters, we could reduce hospital-caused deaths by 100,000 lives in one year. 
or was it 18 months? It was some number like that. 100,000 lives campaign, they called it. At this college, you could have a 100 students campaign if each person in this room would reach out and help just one more student finish the course, come back Monday, come back, enroll, and come back in January, come back next year, finish their college credential at Long Beach City College, you would be well on your way to the goals that President Obama and others has set for us in achieving student success in community colleges. One successful student assisted by every person in this room will help to actually exceed those goals significantly. California's tough. You've had a tough year. You've got another tough year coming. Uh, as you've heard, it's not just in California, but across the country that community colleges are struggling. It is not easy, but it is still possible to get better. It is still possible to focus ourselves collectively and collaboratively on that work. Here we go. Last words. They need to remember that they hold this per person's futures in their hands. And with one wrong action or one wrong word, you can totally turn them off and they'll turn around and walk out the door and never come back. Blessings on you as you go back to your work this new semester. I add my thanks to those of the board and the president for the commitment you have and the work that you do. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, Dr. McClinney. And on behalf of the college, I want to present you with this memento from Long Beach City College. Okay, now it is my pleasure to introduce Mr. Kevin Ryan, the President of our Academic Senate, and Dr. Eva Bagg, our Associate Dean of Institutional Effectiveness, who will now provide us with a presentation on the new program plan and review process. Hello, everyone. Welcome back. Yay, faculty. <laughs> All right. Uh, yeah, we're going to talk to you about, a bit about um, a lot of the hard work that you did in the um, previous year and sort of what came of that. Uh, if we could go ahead and uh, put up the, uh, there we go. Um, yeah, so we're going to talk about uh, your program plan, program uh, uh, review process. Uh, it's sort of a newer process, as a lot of you uh, know. And um, as we went through this process, and this doesn't just apply to faculty, this applies to everyone. Um, as we're going through this process, um, we developed, um, all of you developed all sorts of uh, different goals and things like that. Uh, next slide. Um, it, and next one. Hmm. There we go. Okay. Uh, and so, um, we, we began the process in uh, fall 2009 with this brand new um, uh, system and everything. And there's new computer, uh, I'm sorry, internet um, access to this. And um, it, everything began at the departmental level um, where you developed your, uh, your plan and, uh, for your department and, and everything kind of started there with, with, with uh, either the faculty or in the case of uh, the staff or the administration where everybody kind of came up with uh, what direction they saw themselves going in that year and uh, where they wanted to, to head out. Um, this next one was oh, a little hard to see, and I don't have it here, so let's see if I can remember it. Uh, the, the first one was the departmental planning, uh, where uh, you came up with your departmental plans. And again, I really want to emphasize uh, this is a newer uh, process, and your departmental plans, um, maybe in the past, maybe there was some rollover, and it just kind of was just something that you did to kind of get out of the way, or, or whatever the case was. Now it's becoming a much more important uh, factor, where you're really going to want to take a look at those plans and really uh, get some use out of them. Um, the next stage was it went to a group, I, I can't. A validation group, um, and uh, the validation group was just to make sure that um, everything that you put in your plan was uh, written appropriately and all the forms were filled out the proper way and all that type of thing, and it actually said what the department uh, wanted it to say. The next group it went to uh, was going to, 
the interlevel uh, group, which means um, it went to the, the dean of the area. And the dean of the area um, basically took each of the departments and sort of came up with a school goal. Um, a list of goals where um, they, they, they took all the department goals and kind of coalesced them into a, a bunch of uh, school goals. goals. Uh, and then the next step was it went to the, um, the vice president level. So for example, in the academic um, area, um, they took all the academic deans, they all got together with uh, uh, Vice President Burrs and kind of came up with the academic goals as well as the student services goals and the, um, the um, administrative services and all, all the uh, different areas. Um, and came up with those goals, and, um, and it, as I'm saying this, it sounds like it was a like no big deal type thing. This was a lot of hard work for you, for us, for everybody that was trying to do this. This was no simple task of trying to collate all, all these ideas and get them down into something that's actually manageable. Um, the next stage was it went to the um, VP level uh, where all of the VPs, uh, vice presidents got together with members of um, the, the academic senate um, and we got together and tried to coalesce all of those goals into something manageable. Um, I, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe in the academic area there were like 57 goals that, that initially. And it, that, that's just not useful or, or manageable. It was just so much. Um, so we came up with um, a, a grouping and we got it down to um, about nine goals. And that was hours and hours of meeting. I mean, that, that, was, that was no small task either. Um, I don't know where I am on this chart here, but eventually um, we uh, took these goals and we went to uh, the, the College Planning Committee, and, um, which is the, the planning committee that kind of oversees the whole planning process, which makes up of um, the, the Senate's Executive um, Committee as well as uh, the Vice Presidents. I co-chair it with um, Don Burrs and uh, Eva's tons of help there. Um, but uh, so we, we went there, it got um, approved. Um, in addition to the nine goals that we had, there, was, um, there, there were a list of activities that came with it um, that we didn't want to lose those ideas because there were a lot of really good ideas. But today we're just gonna be showing the overarching uh, goals that we came up with. Uh, these goals after, um, um, and, and of course the, the nine goals went to President Oakley where, where he, um, we had some discussions and, and kind of solidified everything. After all that was done, then finally, we were able to come up with a way to um, have planning precede the budgeting, which is kind of the whole reason why we're trying to do this. The whole, you're always supposed to have the planning driving the budgeting instead of the other way around, and that, that's been fairly difficult to do. This is um, sort of the first time that we've made a, a really good attempt at that, uh, at, at doing that. And it wasn't a perfect process. We learned a lot um, of things that worked, things that didn't work. Um, but eventually it went to, these nine goals went to the Budget Advisory Committee, uh, which is the um, shared governance committee that oversees the, the budgeting processes. And um, in that committee, um, those were used to influence the budget assumptions, which um, is sort of the beginning of the budgeting process uh, for the college. So I think I hit all the, did I miss any of the levels in there? Oh, then of course it went to the board, yes. Uh, and, um, after all of this, um, it was presented to the board and, and the board accepted that as well. And I think I hit all the pretty colors up there. So uh, next slide, please. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Uh, the very first one was fiscal responsibility. <laughs> um, that, that was sort of an obvious one where we, we couldn't just spend as much money as we wanted to, even though, of course, as faculty, we just want to go for it, but we can't always do that. Um, the next one is uh, student success, of course. Um, and it goes beyond, of course, just transfer and certificates and everything. We want our students to just be successful. I mean, that's why we're here. Um, and it, I know it's kind of a buzzword to use the uh, student success. You know, there's the initiative and all these other things. But genuinely, as an instructor, as a professor uh, like many of you, I really want my students to be successful. I mean, that is my goal. And I know that doesn't just extend just to faculty. I know that, that certainly goes beyond to all the staff, all the administration. Uh, that is certainly their goal. Uh, basic skills, um, as, um, as she mentioned earlier, uh, that really is clutch. Um, that was an interesting statistic, I thought, about if uh, in their first term, if they get through a basic skills course, then they're more likely to be successful. That, that's definitely a nugget worth putting in your pocket there. Um, the Pacific Coast campus, um, I, I love this campus. I teach here every semester. Yeah, it's, it's a great campus. So if you've never worked over here, try to 
try to get a chance to do that. It's really a great place to be. Um, besides all of the construction that's going on now and will be continuing to go on, uh, we, definitely developing the Pacific Coast campus is uh, the direction uh, that we want to go. There's so much potential here. And uh, the students here are just amazing. I just absolutely love it here. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the career and tech education, that's where we are right now, um, amongst uh, uh, other places, uh, e even on the other campus, um, is where we wanted to focus. Now, the first five goals were, um, were listed in order, meaning the first one was the highest priority. This would be the fifth highest priority. I told you there were nine goals. The, the remaining four goals are very important, but they were not listed as a, as a priority, uh, meaning they were not prioritized. They're, they are a priority. They're not prioritized. Uh, so the, the next bunch are here. Uh, distance learning, expanding that program um, in, in a healthy way, uh, certainly in, in a way that, that's going to be useful to the students, um, equal and equitable and all that. Uh, staff diversity, uh, we want to continue to emphasize that. Uh, that's very important. Uh, technology and facilities in infrastructure. Um, as new buildings start coming online, new technologies are being implemented into them. Uh, for example, the T building. Um, which, if you haven't had a chance to walk through it, you, you really should check that out. It, it's, th those classrooms are remarkable. They're really beautiful. But um, the whole infrastructure, the technology, everything um, is coming up. And then the workforce development. Uh, certainly getting, getting our students from here into the job market is definitely a high priority. And I am now going to turn over to Ms. Eva Bag here for the um, upcoming uh, new educational master plan that's going to be developed. Thank you. Thank you. I just uh, want to comment on the institutional goals that uh, Kevin just presented. You know, first of all, thank you everybody for participating. I know it was a lot of work and it's a new process and I think it was really a remarkable coming together. The entire college sort of regrouped themselves and, you know, came up with plans at the department level that was fed up through the various levels that Kevin had talked about. And one of the things when we were designing this new process, we took input from you and heard that, you know, we want to feel as though what's happening at the level of students in the classroom and also with students on the front line in A&R, financial aid, etc., that our goals in meeting student needs are heard at higher levels. And, you know, I can tell you that we presented these goals to the board um, last, a couple weeks ago, and they're looking at the institutional goals developed, so to speak, from the ground up to inform the board goals, the revised goals that they're working on now. So I think that on that level we accomplished what we wanted as a body to do. The other thing, as Kevin said, we want our goals to inform the way we allocate resources. And if not today, later on, early in the semester, I think your deans and department heads will articulate, you know, even though in tough economic times, how it is that you're planning to accomplish specific things fed into our capital outlay process, our VITEA projects um, priorities. So we really are trying to you know, think about what's really important and then have the resources follow that. And again, as Kevin said, it's not a perfect process. We're going to you know, refine that this year. And then the, the part of the presentation that I'm going to address here is our new educational master plan. The 2005-2010 educational master plan is expiring this year, so now we're faced with thinking ahead for the next five years. And so this is, you know, in my mind hearing Dr. McClenney speak, you know, we want to really focus collectively on what's important for us to achieve, especially with regard to student success, and pare it down to those significant things that together we want to set goals. We want to set high expectations for ourselves as we do for our students, right? We'll set those goals, we'll agree on those over the coming year, and we'll decide purposefully what we think we need to do in order to achieve those goals. And then lastly is to really focus on, you know, how are we doing along the way on an annual basis or every semester? Collect the data, you know, whether it's quantitative or qualitative, and say how are we doing towards achieving our goals so that we can reach what we, you know, collectively decide is most important. So this is just a timeline to tell you this is the work coming up over the next year. We're in the process of developing um, a community uh, assessment and we're going to be hosting some community forums. We think it's really important to hear from outside of ourselves 
the service area that we serve. We want to hear what's important to, to the rest of the community. We'll also hear as much as we can from students and get their input on the development of these goals, as well as yourselves. And you're already well on your way providing input from the work that you did last year in developing your plans. But as I said, you have the opportunity to refine those. So next year at this time, we will have completed our new educational master plan and we'll roll it out at that time and be on our way to a new set of um, objectives for ourselves. Thank you. Thank you, Eva and Kevin, for that enlightening presentation on the progress of our program uh, plan and program review process. We are almost coming to a close here. We have a couple of things to do, uh, and then we're done. But first of all, I want to thank our special guest, Dr. McClinney, for that great presentation. One more time, let's give her a round of applause. Now for a long list of thank yous. Uh, obviously, pulling something like this today um, together, College Day 2010 at PCC took a lot of effort and a lot of teamwork from many different departments. So if you can just bear with me, I'm going to go down. I'm not going to miss a few people, so please forgive me. Uh, we'll catch you later. But pulling this together takes a lot of people and a considerable amount of work uh, and teamwork. So as we adjourn to our group meetings, I want to thank the following for helping to transform this room into an intimate and unique setting here for College Day 2010 at PCC. First, there are several key people who play vital roles and worked very hard to make College Day at PCC a reality. And so on behalf of the college, I would like to thank Mr. Chichong Kern, Mark Taylor, and the staff of Community Relations and Marketing. Let's give them a round of applause. <laughs> Ms. Cindy Hanks, Sean Carroll, Jerome Thomas, Fred Rossmanak, and Greg Montgomery from Instructional and Information Technology Services. Ms. Cheryl, Miller, Cheryl Williams, Susan Trask, Danny Toe, Alfred Garcia, and their custodial and grounds transportation teams uh, that include the following individuals, Tammy, Aaron, Darren, Rick, Chris, Renna, Roy, Juan, and Anthony. Also want to thank Ms. Vicki Lurch for her scheduling wizardry, uh, Ms. Mary Backeldowney from the Office of the Associate Vice President. And of course, for all the beautiful uh, flower and plant arrangements, uh, Mr. Jorge Ochoa and Brian Hasty from our horticulture department. <laughs> also want to thank Mr. Daniel Perkins of Aviation for helping us set up the uh, breakfast area there in the aviation yard. <laughs> and of course, Dr. Greg Schultz uh, for his assistance with the setup and preparation as well here at PCC. And last, but certainly not least, a great big thanks to Ms. Camille Bolton for all of the work that she's done to pull together today. And we also want to thank Lynn Hernandez and Bill Zellinger for coming through, as always, when we've had such large-scale events. And most importantly, I want to thank all of you for taking the time to be here at this very special day, uh, College Day at PCC 2010. So let's give yourself a round of applause. And, and just so you know, we have uh, about 400 chairs in here. So if everybody's curious about attendance, we were looks like about 420, 425. So that exceeded our expectations for the day. So uh, we really appreciate you taking time to be here. OK, well, I know we're, we're running a slightly behind schedule, just a few minutes. So we're going to ask that uh, once we adjourn, that people hurry along to their meeting area. Uh, and to remind folks that the faculty will remain in this room for the faculty group meetings. Classified staff will adjourn to the Student Center, which is in Building EE. -E. Hold on, a couple of announcements. And the management team will adjourn to Dyer Hall, which is in Building FF.